Um, so this is the solo role playing. Thank you. Thank you, disembodied voice. <laughs> so this is the solo role playing game uh, panel discussion. Uh, my name is Craig Maloney, and I will be the titular host of this entire uh, affair. Joining me also as one of the hosts is Bo Sheldon. Would you please introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Bo Sheldon. Um, I am a gender fluid, non-binary, masculine creator of various tabletop role playing games, uh, including Of the Woods, Let, Let Me Take a Selfie, Turn, and I've worked on a lot of larger properties as well. And um, I also created the Script Change RPG Toolbox for safety, content, and consent. And that's where most people know me from. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so what I wanted to do real quick is I wanted to briefly go over a little bit about what a solo RPG is, uh, show some of the history and some different examples of, of those types of uh, books as well, and, and various types of games. And then uh, open up the discussion a little bit to um, other things like, you know, personal experiences with this stuff, maybe some tools. We'll see where the discussion goes. Um, there's not a whole lot planned. Um, and I find sometimes that can be some of the, the most scary and interesting ways of going about all of this stuff. But uh, let's see where we can go with this. Uh, once again, we are recording this. So um, one of my first experiences with the solo RPGs was this little book here which is uh, what I refer to as the branching story. Uh, this is the Warlock of Firetop Mountain. Uh, there was a whole series of, of what was considered fire fighting fantasy books. Um, and they were all in the, the what folks would refer to as uh, CYOA adventures. Uh, if they're going to issue a whole bunch of takedowns for folks, they can do their own marketing. Um, but yes, these are the idea of these books is that you have a character sheet at the very beginning of this book and you fill out the character sheet and then you proceed through and do your branching story. So it'll have a thing where you start off, you say, it'll say, okay, you run into this particular contest. And if you uh, pass this, then go to this. If you fail the contest, then you go over to some other, other uh, part of the story. And so it branches through the, the story. And there are other examples of this as well. There is um, what's known as, it's collectively referred to as Solo Quest. Uh, this is from Rune Quest. Um, there's also ones from Chaosium for Call of Cthulhu, uh, which is um, the Alone Against. And it's like the Flames, the Tide, the Frost, um, basically a whole bunch of these type of things. And these, I found with the, the Alone Against the Flames, it was a little more interesting because it didn't, it had interesting failure in it. So it was, you weren't necessarily like, you know, shoved off into a pit and that was the end of it. It was, oh, you there's actually something that you did not get a hold of. And so you could actually have a successful ending where it's like you survived, but you really didn't learn what was going on in the whole story. And that made for a much more interesting choice. And I think part of that with, uh, with solo role-playing games is the ability to have an interesting encounter with whatever material you're doing. There needs to be some interesting choices with this. Mm -hmm. And with some of these things, you get stuff like, um, I'm going to show this, which is the game Gloom of Killforth. And you can, can call this an interest. It's, it's interesting in that it straddles the realm between role-playing game and board game pretty effectively um, because there's interesting choices in this, in this box. There's still a predetermined outcome. It's you either, you know, succeed by, um, they call it night, uh, night and day cards. There's 25 cards in the night pile. And so once you get through all those cards, the game is over. And so you're supposed to succeed with whatever it is, or you're done. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, so you, you're limited. It's not like you can go sojourn throughout the entire town and have interesting encounters with various folks. You're pretty well limited to whatever mm -hmm. is inside this box. And to me, that is one of the things about solo role-playing games that makes it a little more interesting is that, number one, you don't necessarily have to... There, there's just very... You have interesting decisions in, that you can make with all this stuff. Bo, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. So I, I come at this from a much more recent perspective, obviously, because I only started 
designing games and playing indie games in the last 10 years. Um, and a lot of the games that I have played and designed that are solo games are a lot more freeform and have a lot fewer uh, crunchy mechanics and focus more on things like really good questions that have open options or they have the like complex ability to kind of use small mechanics to influence things in a big narrative way. So there's things like Thousand Year Old Vampire, which is by Tim Hutchings and is one of the most like detailed and complex modern solo games that has been out um, in that it mostly is prompts and journaling, but there's this memories mechanic where you gain and lose memories over time as a vampire. And you have to make complex decisions about like what those memories mean to you, how they influence your character and things like that. And I think that even the simplest games with like the simplest prompts can make you in solo games challenge your own perceptions and like what you really are afraid of or interested in seeing in your own narrative. Um, of the Woods is a collection that I did with a couple of other designers. And the games are just, for the most part, a series of less than 10 questions. And you just play through it and tell a story. And they were, um, basically we started writing them on Google Plus back when that existed, <laughs> back in the day. Uh, and um, I posted one on Google Plus and people played it in the comments and then other people made theirs based on it because it was such a, such a simple format. But the whole purpose of them was just asking these like open-ended but leading questions to tell a specific kind of story. And I think that's like one of the best things about solo games is that you get just this unlimited possibility of telling the story based on like what your impulse is and what the game challenges you with. Like what is what is the like difficult question or difficult like mechanic that you encounter that you have to work against as an individual as opposed to with a collaborative group. Yeah. And that is one of the big things with uh, with a lot of solo RPGs is you can go anywhere from a simple dungeon crawl to something where it's it's like an absolute gut punch. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a couple of these things like um, I'm just going to pull a couple of these out here, like uh, micro chat books. These are basically just dungeon crawls mm -hmm. inside of a book. And they, they give you little prompts in here like, OK, uh, you roll a D6 or roll two D6s, and this is the type of thing that you're going to be encountering mm -hmm. further along. Whereas um, with some of the solo RPGs, and I'm trying to remember the one that was with Kevin Culp. Um, damn it, I should have written notes. Um, but that was, uh, it, it was basically asking you, like you were, you're acting as a time, uh, time traveler to certain parts of your history. Oh, and so then yeah. You would, yeah, and I'm, I'm really spacing on it. It was a Kickstarter and Damn it, if I can remember. But it was, um, and I'll probably just go and check it real quick uh, when I get yeah. a chance. But it was about going into these various parts, and you only had a certain number of words that you could write about to let yourself know about something that was going to happen in your future. And it was a really interesting mechanic for just getting into and thinking about, okay, these are certain things that happened and how to go, go forward with some of mm -hmm. those things. So you've got a, that whole level of complexity of just, you know, poking around and, and it's like, okay, there's a room here and it's this big and there's treasure. Uh, so go find it and then go find the big baddie at the very end of it and take care of them uh, versus deep, dig deep into yourself and pull something out of there. Yeah. One of the, one of the recent solo games that um, I reviewed that I really liked and I am biased it's by one of my partners, but I like the game so much that I can never stop talking about it. It's called A Grieblin's Journey. And it basically is about uh, this kind of character that you play called a, a Grieblin that's sort of like a goblin, but can be really anyone who would be isolated and kind of never have left home before. And throughout this story, it uses this really interesting like blackjack dice roll mechanic where you reach like 21 prompts and you're done. And um, 
you tell the story of leaving home to this fantastical place for the first time. And I was really kind of compelled by how like just the simplest parts of the prompts just, I guess they, they spur your creativity so much. And I think that's one of the best things about like the dungeons and that they've done in the past is that like they have just enough information to like let you tell the rest of it on your own. Like I really like journaling games. Um, I like playing them a lot, but like I love seeing like games that are hybrids where there's like dice rolling and like stuff like that combined with some journaling and like storytelling. And I, I, I think that we're kind of in a flourishing time for solo games, like especially with the pandemic. I'm sure pretty much everyone is aware a lot of us couldn't go to our gaming groups. Like that was really hard. And if you look on places like H.io, I reviewed for my birthday month in February, I reviewed 33 solo games. And that was like the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> there are like hundreds on there. And they have so many varieties of the way you play. There are ones that are like meditation. There are ones that are like adventures that are really complex. There are ones that you pass on to other players to play and then they come back to you eventually. It's just, it's completely mind blowing what you can do with such a simple concept. The game that I was thinking of that I spaced on was Wait For Me. Mm. Uh, Kevin Cult and Name Withheld, uh, Jayon Shim. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that one. Um, yeah, and to a certain extent too, there's you can take a lot of things. Um, there's a, another company that uh, produces a whole bunch of solo RPG supplements for just about everything out there. Um, I know there's one for Dungeon World. There's one for, they did one for Fate, which I'm like, okay, how exactly would you do Fate? But they, they, they did, um, as well as other sort of ones like that. And, and that one is, um, the name of the company is, why did I bury all this stuff inside of folders? Uh, that's awesome. So they, they have a whole bunch of different systems out there for doing these uh, things. They also have one for Delta Green as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, da, 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 parts Per Million uh, is the name of the company that does all these things. So there are yeah. ways of, of translating your traditional games that are not necessarily written for solo gaming and then mm -hmm. popping them over into uh, a solo environment. And many of them use... Um, a mechanic that's called an oracle. And the oracle is where you have a random table of various words. And depending on the me mechanic or something like that, like you have certain things where it'll be like a roll of D100, and then this is what the oracle will tell you. Or it'll mm -hmm. be certain things like a yes, no type answer. Um, Mythic is really good about um, various different yes, no answers. And I'll pull that book out as well in a second. But that is um there's there's ways of, of not only giving you stuff like yes and yes but no mm -hmm. and no but you know or flat out no way um there's also other things like uh you know ad different adjectives like creepy or scary or some other thing like that um so there are other ways of of pulling yourself into this thing and giving yourself a, a few more prompts to let your imagination keep going and, and tell the story yeah, absolutely. I think that like the complexity and variety of solo game mechanics is just as strong as our traditional multiplayer games. One of the games that really captured my interest, um, in part because it's one of the games that um, really captured the kind of feeling of the Mines of Moria and Lord of the Rings for me the most, um, was Lost in the Deep by Diogo Negreira. Um, and it uses a block tower, D6 rolls, playing cards, and journaling. And it sounds like a lot, but like Diego really did a good job like integrating the whole thing. And it, like the game kind of has inevitable end. You're in the Minds of Moria at the end kind of vibe. And the storytelling, like it just plucks from so many different ways of randomizing in such an elegant way 
that you never feel like you're fully guiding the story on your own. It really feels like it has a life of its own in the same way that like a collaborative game tends to feel. And I thought it was really impressive. Yeah, so one of the, the grand dams of, of uh, role-playing, solo role-playing games, at least the one that, that managed to come out and really set the standard for what that would be as far as um, like adapting most systems to a solo role playing game is Mythic by Tana Pigeon, and mm, yeah, this is. I mean, there, there's a new revision that's coming out, and revision is. A, I say that word loosely because honestly, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. I think it's mostly just about layout and stuff, and updating the layout so it's not quite as two thousand. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's an incredible book as far as being able not only to give you just the actual system, but being able to adapt that system to various other, other things where you're like, okay, not only do I have this other system that I can work with, but I also have a way of, of doing a GM-less type environment with this. And it's really, really cool stuff. Yeah, I think I think that there's such a, 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 a variety of approaches to solo gaming yeah. and like, I, as, as I focus like more on like the indie games and the the kind of flowier stuff, I guess, while I was going through it, I also found like a lot of the old choose your adventure type solo games that you play like, um, there's a, a guy on Loading Ready Run, uh, Adam Sabadan, who has been playing through some of them and uh, doing, doing them like on stream and like telling people like what he rolls and everything like that. And it's, it's so cool to see like these these games that are like they're this thick. They're like the size of novels, and they create the kind of experience that you normally would see somebody have if they were playing like at a table with their friends, but just as an individual. Like, and I just think it's so rad. Like, I'd like to see like uh that I'd like to see solo games continue like in both paths, like continuing to see more of you know, these complex and, and more traditional style games, as well as more of like the games that are kind of sit down and play without dice sort of storytelling games, because I think that there's beauty in both of them. Yeah. I know for me, the one that really, that really pulled me out and said, this is, this is something that I could do and actually uh, really enjoy the experience of it. Cause, and unfortunately, I mean, I mean, I'm of the age where, this was my idea of a solo game. And it's like, it's very pre-programmed. You really don't have a whole, you have options, but you basically have a, you know, two or three options at any given point. Mm -hmm. But what really pulled me into this was uh, this game, Iron Swarm. And oh, yeah. the, re the reason that it pulled me into this is because not only did it have the, the power by the apocalypse mechanics of player facing roles, which is like absolutely brilliant, but mm -hmm. it's like taking that and adapting it into a system where not only do you have the player facing roles, but you also have the, you know, the moves and you have the oracles that are based into it. And it, it was not so much about, okay, here's this semi pre-programmed path, but it was really open-ended. Mm -hmm. So we were playing one instance. I mean, you can play this game cooperatively as well, which is also yeah. a nice feature of a lot of the solo RPG stuff is that if you have, more than one person you can collaboratively play together yeah and what was brilliant about it is that in our play session uh there was a monkey and it's like there's no monkey in this book at all but both of us agreed that a monkey needed to happen so a monkey happened it's like there's very few platforms that would allow you to do something like that like with the you know the gloom of killforth monkey can't happen Mm -hmm. But in a solo RPG, if, if you want something like that to happen, if it needs to happen for whatever reason, and don't ask me why a monkey needed to happen, <laughs> it just had to. That was just all there was to it. That it allows you to at least progress with that and say, okay, now monkey has occurred. Let's deal with that. And that monkey was yeah. getting into everything, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I really like about solo games is like, especially when you're playing by yourself, you have like full permission to go like as far as you want or to be as like subdued as you want with your story and like explore all the things that like come up, right? 
uh, one of the games that I designed as part of Let Me Take a Selfie, which is my collection that's like, you use selfies, uh, like phone camera pictures to tell stories and play games. Um, the game is called The Story of My Face. And the way you play it is you go somewhere public and you pretend that you are being chased by magical hunters of some kind and that you're in danger. And then you take photos of yourself and journal basically what happened when you took that picture or right before. And you basically try and scare yourself until the end of the story. And it's pretty open-ended, but the few people who have like actually reported back to me to play it uh, have said that it was like exhilarating because they were like, I didn't know that I could scare myself that bad. Like, <laughs> you know, and it's like, you just open up so much possibility because you're controlling how much you engage and you don't have to trust someone else to like stay within your boundaries or anything. And while as a safety RPG like kind of person, I advocate still using some kind of safety tools when you're playing by yourself. Like most of that's just taking breaks and being aware of your own choices and decisions. So like when people play games, like there are some horror games that I played for uh, 33 and 28 this February that were like, really scary and all it was was a brief description and my brain just went with it like <laughs> like there's more in the scene than they told me and it's because i thought of things that scared me and i think that that is like the best part of like every time i sit down and play a solo game because i never know what my brain is going to come up with and there's no one to stop me and it's so exciting you know that is that is true because yeah, I mean, and that, that's really what many of the uh, the solo games are all about, is just giving you the prompts and letting your mind wander off with it. And so something, you know, where you, you look at it objectively and it's like, what the heck is creeping me? Or something like that. It's like, why yeah. would that Why would that do anything for me? You know, it, you know, sitting here reading this, creepy, what, you know, whatever. But if you're engaging with it, and if you're allowing yourself to feel that, Creepy can be anything. And I'm not going to try and describe creepy for you because you already know what creepy is for you. And that's part yeah. of the, the beauty of all this stuff is that it's a very intimate and personal relationship with a lot of these games that you don't necessarily get with a whole lot of other games. Because, you know, with the, with the Cthulhu mythos or, or something else, it's like, you know, the, the, the GM will tell you something like that. And it's like, OK, you know, whatever. Oh, we're going down. It's me go again. You know, that sort of thing. But if you're, you know, I, I, if you're really engaged with it, it's like, oh, I really want to, I want to have an en encounter with Migo, and I want them to be the the baddest Migo that I think that I've ever seen. It's like, you're going to have that experience, or at least I hope you do. Yeah, um, I was playing the Mysteries of Addie C, which is like a, it's a solo game where you journal and you travel through a haunted house, right? Um, and it's actually set somewhere in like relevant to where I live and everything. So like I was va vaguely familiar with it. And it's like this old bed and breakfast and in one of the rooms you encounter, it just talks about hearing this thudding noise against a bathtub. And that's it. It describes like virtually nothing else in the whole scene. And I got so scared I had to stop playing the game because it was like dark outside and I managed to spook myself thinking about what all of the things it could be would be. And there was nobody to there and say can you stop like being creepy to yourself <laughs> and it was it was really fun and exciting and i think that the the open-ended like leading questions and prompts that we have that like kind of build up these really good solo games are the, the like bread and butter of like self-creativity like someone actually used of the woods my collection that i had mentioned earlier in a writing class um to help writers like get familiar with just like going off of prompts and just going and telling stories. And it was really amazing to see how just their creativity blossomed in that experience. Very cool. And there's there's also other games. Um, now, I, I'm going to bring this up. And you know, it's not necessarily a solo game as written, but you could probably use something like this um, without necessarily the interactivity bits, because there's you know the, a piece where you're actually doing the role playing piece, um, and you'd have to figure out a way to do that because this isn't going to help you with that. But at least getting to where you could start off, you know, with the light and the dark and all that other kind of stuff, and then move through that entire scenario, you could probably create something like that with something like 
like a microscope or one of these other types of games. Um, oh yeah. The Definitely. quiet year as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's designed for three to five folks, but you could probably also play it solo. And I've heard people say that they played it solo as kind of like this meditation of like, okay, we're going to fill out this whole land and whatnot. And then you don't necessarily get the, the interactivity that was intended by the designers, but at least you can get part of that experience with it. Yeah. Um, so my game, The Man in the Stag, that I just put out, I, I did a itch starter like on itch.io. Um, it's technically a two-player game, but one of the first people who played it and reviewed it um, played it solo. And they just did it as like a self-journaling game. And the story they told was really amazing. So I think that you can take most games and break them down and, and do that solo experience. It just takes a little bit of fiddling. There's a quick question in the channel about mm -hmm. what Microscope is. Um, Microscope is a game where you start off with a beginning and an end. And it's usually, it'll be something either like um, light or dark, usually about whether the mood is going to be on an uptick or a downtick, um, whether it's going to be, you know, happy or sad or whatever you, whatever up and down means for you in that realm. And it'll allow, it allows you then to fill in the blanks in between. So let's say you have at the very end, Nuke Atlantis, which is the, I think the example that they have in the book. And then um, as a light part, you know, the, the revolution, you know, the, the rise of Atlantis or something like that. And then you can come up with all the various pieces in between. And you don't necessarily have to fill out every single little detail, but at least you can you can expand it out as you need to, to explain, okay, you know, this is the uptick, this is a downtick or something like that for the entire story of, of Atlantis. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Yeah, I, re I really like games like Microscope. Um, and I, I do wish there were more dedicated solo games like them, but there, there are some. Um, and they're becoming a little bit more popular with the time that everyone is spending in isolation, where you're basically like telling a, a chronological or a chronological story. Um, and it's more of a complex, like big arc, not necessarily like something dedicated for like everyday role playing. Um, and I think that that can create some really fun storytelling and stuff on a broader scale. And I think it's very useful for writers, which I know there are a lot of writers at PangaCon. Um, I've some, seen a lot of them talking in the chats and stuff. And honestly, I think that these kinds of games can be really useful to just like play and write off of and branch off of and tell your own stories using inspiration from the games. Because there's no rule saying you have to stay within it. Yeah, and that is that is another piece as well as the again, it you know, making monkey happen and whatnot. The the rules as written don't necessarily have to be the the rules that you follow. And you're you're in control of all the various things that are occurring. So let's say that there's a rule about um at the very end of this, there's a boss monster, and then at the very end of it, your character goes off to whatever, and that's the end of it. It's like you don't necessarily have to do that. You could also say, "Well, I'm going to go back in again, or something like that, or I'm going to do something else with my character." And then some of them um, will allow you to chain various uh, encounters. Like um, there, there's one where it's like, "Yeah, you can take your character, then and move them on throughout all the rest of the series of all these various books and that." And mm -hmm. some of them, like you know, Four Against Darkness or whatnot, um, which is about four players. Or sorry, you you play four different characters in the scenario, and that they have a leveling system that allows you to level up your character, much in the same way like an actual dungeon crawl type thing. But they've got various different types of them too. They've got you know, if you wanted to play something like a four against Mars, you could do something like that. Um, they've got four against the great old ones, which has you know, after forty days, the great old ones come around, and unless you manage to stop them, well, guess what? Uh, bad things happen. Um, there's also four against the Titans. So if you're like an absolute nerd about Greek mythology, like I am, then there's this for you <laughs> in that. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of different ways of playing this stuff. And again, you're not necessarily constrained by the rules of the system as written. If something doesn't work for you, change it. Um, you're the only one that has to worry about it. Yeah, I, I think that the ability to like change what's happening is really good. And I also like that there are, there's kind of a, 
a little bit of a boost lately in more positive solo games that are focused more on like uh, positive exploration of self or maybe only happy stories. Like there's one called The Village Witch where you're just a witch trying to find her like final home being the witch for that town, which is a really fun, um, just like kind of exploratory experience. Um, Morning Phase is a nostalgia cartography game where you think about something in your past and then carto cartography based kind of map it out and kind of explore the connections between the people and the thoughts and experiences using prompts to do that. Um, and my favorite is it's called Bro Is It Gay to Dock? <laughs> and it's it's uh, by um, uh, When Conditions and it, you play a pirate who is in love with the legend. Um, and the legend, you get to like detail who they are and what they're like and why you love them and all of this stuff. And you just play through like moments of experiencing how amazing they are and how in love with them you are. And it's a very positive and fun kind of thing to play that's very silly inherently, but like having solo games like that and then having contrasting solo games like the machine where you're trying to work on this like impossible to fix machine and eventually you fail and pass it on to the next person. Like there's such a, a complexity of emotion that you can explore in these games. And like, it all comes back to like, knowing that being your, by yourself doesn't limit you. And I think that that's a big, big awesome thing that's happening with games right now. Yeah, definitely. Are there any questions so far? Anything that any of us would like to explore a little bit further? You can type it in chat, or if you feel like uh, if the spirit moves you and you wish to unmute yourself, you may do so. So if you, so Bo, if you had, um, if you wanted to recommend to someone, where did I get those books? Uh, some of these came from Amazon. Um, some of them also came from Drive Through RPG through their print on demand system. Um, so yeah, um, the the fighting fantasy ones. These ones, um, these came from my childhood. You can find additional copies of them. They they were released through Scholastic, and Scholastic has been rather good about um, keeping them somewhat in print. And there's also a website uh, for picking them up. Do I know the Fabled Lands series? I am not familiar with that one. I have heard of it, but I've never actually been able to play it. Oh, and before we get too far, yes, I've heard of Tunnels and Trolls. Um, and apparently that's very good for solo role-playing games. And I picked up a copy of it in PDF and Buffalo Castle. So eventually I will probably take a look at it. Because apparently you can't say the word solo RPGs and not have someone bring up uh, Tunnels and Trolls. <laughs> I mean, it, I've heard of it. It's very popular. Like <laughs> Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Because anytime that I brought it, I brought it up with some friends, like, oh, have you heard of Tunnels or Barbarian Prince is another one um, that's a, a classic one as well. That I took a look at the PDF and I was like, I don't have the mental bandwidth to even understand this uh, Fable Land. Okay, there's also um, as far as branching stories, there was also the Lone Wolf series, which evaded my radar, and I'm not sure uh, why it did. Um, but yeah, oh, okay. So these are uh, fantasy game books written by established game book authors Dave Morris and Jamie Thompson, hmm. or Thompson, published by Pan Books, uh, according to Wikipedia, which is never wrong about this. I find it really interesting the kind of uh, weird connection and yet still division between stuff like choose your own adventure books and literary people writing games that are storytelling games and role-playing games, but they are not in the role-playing sphere as much. Um, it's a, There's still like a weird division there, even though like they are very similar in a lot of ways and could learn from each other kind of in different ways. And I'm hoping that eventually that like breaks down because like I know choose your own adventure, you still can't even use that term whenever you you know make a game, you have to use like some sort of variation because it's copyrighted and everything. But like people basically make choose your own adventure games <laughs> and just call it something different. So yeah, exactly. I, I think 
part of it is that you can, and this gets to the, the Chris Crawford discussion that was before, where people would, um, th it's easy to think about branching stories and how all that stuff would branch through. And, and usually the branches are, you did something bad, you die. Um, because it's a simplest, you know, if then else thing. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. well, guess what? You, you, you don't get to go on any further. And I think that was what I found interesting about the chaosium alone against the whatever it is um, mm -hmm. series is that it it gave slightly interesting choices mm -hmm. that didn't necessarily all end horribly. I mean, the end, ending horribly in, in Call of Cthulhu is basically just a given. Right. Um, <laughs> unless you manage to prevent everything and catch every single clue. And but, like there's yeah. some there's some beauty to games that have like fatalism. Um, so long as they make the path there worth it. And I think sometimes for me, I enjoy fatalism in solo games more than in collaborative, collaborative games, because in a collaborative game, I'm working so much harder. I'm doing so much more with other people. There's so much more time and investment whenever it's by myself. Like if I know going in, I'm going to die at the end of the story, like with lost in the deep, I'm like, Oh, cool. Like, that's just what's going to happen. And I can accept that. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and that's, to a certain extent, it's, it's, you're playing to find out what happens. It's not so much that you're playing to win it or that you're playing to collect all 99 treasures or some other thing like that. It's that you're playing for the experience of, mm -hmm. of, you know, having the experience of, okay, I'm an adventurer and I'm going through all these various things. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with going through and saying, I collected all 99 treasures. Yay me. I mean, if that's the thing that makes you excited, by all means, I, don't let yeah. me stop you collect all those 99 <laughs> treasures. Um, but yeah, that's, you You get the breadth of experience between, okay, I've collected the 99 treasures or I had an incredibly personal and deep experience with this game system that um, mm -hmm. I'm thankful for having. You know, it got me thinking about this stuff. Yeah, like um, one of the games that I, uh, I elected not to play, but I read, uh, was called Soul Quest, I think. Um, and it's it's based on like actual like um, meditative principles and stuff, like Reiki principles. And um, it's a beautiful game. It's wonderfully written, but I knew that it would go way deeper than I was gonna wanna go. <laughs> and I, I do recommend it for anyone who's into that kind of stuff because I think it's beautiful and it's very well written. But there are games that are like built for certain experiences. And I think that, like, with solo games, like, it it takes, like, some some effort and energy sometimes up front for people to decide whether they want to engage with it. And that can be a little bit discouraging. So uh, cyberpunk-themed solo games. This is called Utopia. It is a cyberpunk-themed solo game. Uh, what it is, it's a, um, it is written by, let me get the name here. Uh, da, da, da. It's on the inside page. David Mar Markuski, uh, which I'm probably mispronouncing and slaughtering the name. But the idea of it is that there is you are one of very um, five different levels of class in the society, whether you're a high born or um, going down the levels, you could be something like an AI or mud, um, I don't know, mud born or something like that. But anyways, and you can take on jobs um in this society and there's a news board about the various dangers and so you could do things like you can take on hacking stuff you can take on um all sorts of different things uh that you can do in this game and what's neat about it is that it's not necessarily designed for oh we're going to go around and hack the planet or anything like that there's all sorts of different uh backgrounds and ways of of carrying yourself through the society and it's not necessarily you know, ourselves, but in the future, there's, you know, the, there's a whole idea of a fall and then rebuilding the society in a new format and whatnot. So if that's something that speaks to you, this is something that I can recommend uh, checking it out. The mechanics are slightly fiddly. There's a lot of addition to it. So it's like a 2D10 plus six, you know, a, D, a number of D6s and whatnot. Um, that may be something to speak with you, but it also it feels like it borrows a lot from Iron Sworn as well, where you've got the moves in that system so you may be able to if, if the system doesn't speak to you the way that it's it uh is written you may want to tweak it a little bit 
Can you play yeah, with friends? Yeah, it's, yeah, it handles uh, GM play and cooperative play as well. So I, I would check. I definitely recommend checking it out. I think that there's actually a kind of uh, like a dearth of cyberpunk games. Um, but I know that there were a lot of solo games in the Sad Mech RPG Jam. Um, I wrote one I know of Live, Die, uh, Remember, I think is, um, Live, Die, Love, Remember, I think is what it's called. Um, there, there are a couple that are really good, a little bit sad, but very good, like, mech RPGs that you can play solo. Um, if you just look up the Sad Mech RPG Jam, there's a, just a complete wonderland of games under that. Um, and a lot of them are very cyberpunk themed with a lot of that vibe. Um, and many of those creators also make other games that you could find through there too. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that anyone would like us to talk about in the last couple minutes here? So I do have one question, Bo, what would be your desert island solo RPG? Desert Island, Solo RPG. Hmm. That, uh, I'd probably finally find time to play Thousand Year Old Vampire. Um, <laughs> you had the time for it. Which yeah. I want to play so bad, but it's it's very emotional. It deals with memory loss, which is a personal uh, struggle for me. Um, the emotional mech jam? That, that might be the one. There were a couple. Let me uh, just... See if I have the Sad Mac Jam link here. Because there were there were quite a few, quite a few people who did it. Um I can't, I don't know if it's down. Uh I will find it, find the link for it and put it in the um in the chat after this for you. Um I just have to figure out what happened to it. Or you can send uh, <laughs> me via Discord. I'm I've created. I'm compiling a list of all the stuff that we've mentioned in here, awesome. so I'll add that to that uh, website. Uh, which, by the way, if you haven't seen the website, it is uh, shoot. I'm of course, going to off the go. link. But here is the link. Here is yeah. the side mechanism tag on itch.io, and it is it's got like thirty games on there. Not all of them are single player, but um, there are quite a few that are either solo or playable as solo. Awesome. Um, my game Beat is on there, but that's that's it's very sad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not so much of a solo game because you really want friends for it. Um, but uh, yeah, I I think that Thousand Year Old Vampire would be really good because it's got a lot of play for it and a long time to play in it. And um, I also. I really liked um, reading uh, and playing a Greenland's Journey a lot because it's very replayable. And um, I also like to write my own solo games a lot. And I think I'd probably spend a fair amount of time doing that. Yeah. What about you? I'm going to punt and say the one that I'm writing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it always? Uh, it always <laughs> is, yeah. No, the one that I'm writing right now is um, about the birth of the computing industry, and I'm using the irons for mechanics for that and trying wow. to get that all sorted out. And it's a mess um, at the moment, of course, but hopefully it'll coalesce into something very playable and very enjoyable for folks. Awesome. So, thank you. Sorry, Kat. Um no worries. <laughs> I, I've, I've had those experiences. <laughs> he just startled me. It's kind of like Soul of the New Machine. I, I think of it more like, um, uh, so I, I've heard people say that it would probably be something along the lines of Halt and Catch Fire, uh, the RPG, possibly. I don't know. Um, but I'm looking for it from the solo experience as well. Uh, so hopefully it'll be a little more, number one, because I can play test solo a lot faster than I can play test with other folks. And so <laughs> hopefully I can yeah. get that uh, going. Do you have any tips, perhaps, to um, what you would recommend for folks to look into as far as a solo RPG? Or yeah, um, so the first thing that I suggest is uh, if you if you want to play a solo game, um, 
definitely look into like a variety of genres um, and see which one like really in, like gives you enthusiasm. Because uh, I would say one of the biggest things I hear from people who get who try out solo games is they start, but then they realize that like the genre just isn't engaging them because they don't have enough ideas for it or they aren't as interested in it. Um, so there are enough games out there that you can easily like kind of pick and choose something that'll be fun for you because it's like your actual vibe. Um, and once you've done that, um, definitely ensure whether you know if you're comfortable doing the kind of mechanics that they use in the game. Like I can't do a lot of number stuff. So like stuff with a lot of like calculating or anything like that will burn me out immediately. But journaling I can do. However, I have friends who like they write a paragraph and they are done. Um, and also keep in mind that with journaling games and with any kind of solo RPG, you don't have to play it within a set period of time. You can set it down and come back to it later, um, which some people feel intimidated by doing because they're like, what if I forget where I was? It's okay. It's your story. You can do whatever you want with it and there's no one stopping you. Um, you can always look back at what you had in your previous writings or in your notes, or you can just start over, like, over again and just do a different thing. And it doesn't hurt really anything to do so. Um, take your time with it and pace it out if you feel like you're comfortable doing so. That is awesome advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, there are no other comments or questions. Um, I think we will wrap it up. Again, you are Bo Sheldon, and where can folks find more about you? Um, so I have a website at brebo.com, um, and you can find most of my stuff there, including my blog where I talk about games and post about games and interview a ton of designers. Um, and I also have an itch.io at brebo.itch.io, um, where all of my uh, like non-print games are which is like most of my solo games and stuff like that. And you can also find my work on DriveThruRPG and Indie Press Revolution. And I am at Thoughty Games on Twitter. Uh, that's my like professional account where you'll find my game stuff uh, if you're interested in hearing what I have to say. Excellent. And I am at uh, decafbad.net. And uh, I, yeah, I can show you more of these books. Yeah, there's a ton of these things. Like I've got, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you really want to memory lanes. I got a whole bunch of this kind of stuff here. But uh, yes, I am at decafbad.net. And uh, so I will have links again for all the stuff that we've talked about here. And hopefully I will see you all in the solo RPG sphere. So take care. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>